just filled with gratitude to be with all of you today, grateful for the tremendous leadership in this conference, and grateful for each one of you, and grateful for this church for hosting us and the wonderful hospitality. When I speak at this uh, time of the day, I often like to think that I, um, it's best to begin with a little buzz. Yeah. And I mean that in, in three different ways. There's the, the buzz of the coffee, which I'm grateful for this morning. The uh, Holy Spirit buzz that Dr. Davis and Steve helped uh, uh, make us aware of this morning and gain us going. But then uh, the, the third buzz that I like to begin with is the buzz of pollinators. And so uh, I'd like to, in, for you to indulge me for a moment and to consider this question, and I'm actually gonna ask you to turn to your neighbor and give your answer to this question. If you were a pollinator, which pollinator would you be, <laughs> right, and, and why? And so remember pollinators uh, are include bees, hummingbirds, moths, butterflies, bats, and actually much more than that. But uh, so think for a moment about what pollinator you would be and why, and then turn to your neighbor and, and share that. And uh, if somebody runs off, we'll know that you said you're a wasp or something. <laughs> Thank you for uh, indulging me by uh, reflecting on your pollinator qualities uh, this morning. And the reason I like to begin by talking about pollinators is actually uh, for a number of reasons. The first is that they remind us of this interconnected web of creation of which we are a part. It's estimated that one out of every three bites of food that we eat depends upon the work of pollinators. The second reason I like to begin by talking about pollinators is because they are currently suffering, some of them, from massive declines. In the past year, beekeepers in the U.S. lost 44% of their colonies. There are various factors at play for this. Some have to do with pesticides, some have to do with climate change, and some have to do with habitat loss. So if you consider how important pollinators are to our daily lives, and you quickly realize how caring for, about the plight of pollinators is essential for not only caring about humans, but caring about the entire web of creation. The third reason I like to begin by talking about pollinators is because we have a retired UCC clergy uh, pastor in Portland, Oregon named Jim Ruel, who is wild about pollinators and has found a way for churches to make a tangible difference in the lives of pollinators. He writes articles and leads workshops on how congregations can engage in habitat restoration on their own properties to help bring pollinators back. And Jim is also one of our contributors to a UCC blog and environmental justice newsletter called The Pollinator. And why was this name selected? Well, there'd be no promised land of uh, flowing with milk and honey if we didn't have pollinators. Oh. And moreover, there would be no church today if it wasn't for the metaphorical pollinators and pollinating upon which we depend in lives of our congregations. Just as a fruit tree will not bear fruit if it's never visited by a pollinator, the fruitfulness of churches depends upon pollinators. They're those means by which we share everything from theological insight and wisdom to our passion and our visions. And I really feel like one of my main jobs at the UCC is to encourage cross-pollination so that we can have ever more fruitful congregations. I'm going to ask Karen to pass out a brochure that kind of will give you an overview of about what uh, my uh, program and work is about as the environmental justice minister for the UCC. Um, they, it, it covers the communication vehicle through the pollinator. It covers encouraging creation justice churches. It covers working with the newly formed UCC Council for Climate Justice. Um, which we are aiming to have representatives from all the conferences across the country be a part of this national council that raises awareness about climate change within the UCC and seeks to bring us together for common action. 
one of the things I also work on is solidarity support, and I've been delighted to work with Karen in helping address the coal ash situation here in North Carolina, uh, providing an online petition in that effort. Um, we've also done online petitions regarding Flint, uh, and most recently Standing Rock. And so that's uh, some of the ways in which uh, my office gets involved in, in solidarity support. And I also work with Megan Pritchard, who does environmental justice trainings around the country. Before I, I get into kind of the more interactive part, where I hope to dig deep into what it means to be a green church, or what uh, I like to call creation justice churches, I want to share with you a bit about my story so that you can get a sense of why I am uh, deeply passionate about our Creation Justice Churches program. I'm a former uh, church pastor um, until I began this position a year ago. I was a pastor for eight years, and a lot of the joys uh, and shortcomings that I experienced in environmental ministry as a pastor really feed into why I'm so passionate about this. And I, I mentioned shortcomings because I have some regrets um, about partial regrets about uh, my time as a pastor when I think about how my church, things my church could have done that we didn't do, which would have made us all the more, uh, I think, successful in our environmental ministry. And so that, that's part of what I carry with me and being so enthusiastic about uh, joining with others to, to talk about how we can have the strongest churches possible in addressing an environment. So just a bit about my story is when I came to be a pastor, I had never been involved in environmental issues, but I came there knowing that uh, I was in the Portland area, that there is known for being one of the strong places in our country for addressing environmental issues. And I had a, a rising awareness as a doctoral student. I kept reading about climate change and I, and just kind of at a kind of intellectual level, I was like, this is, I really think I need to spend some time, you know, figuring out how we can address this through through ministry. And so when I got to Vancouver, Washington, where I was pastor, I called up the state environmental agency and I found out the leading cause of CO2 pollution in the state was the state's only coal plant. And that would be uh, true for most of our states. The leading cause of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the United States is it comes from electricity generation. And, uh, and so I, I called up the Sierra Club and they said, hey, we're just now starting a campaign we'll, uh, to close down, transition away from the coal plant. Uh, can we do an event at your church? And I said, sure. We did an event and that led to um, are, are founding a chapter of the uh, Beyond Coal campaign in the state of Washington at my church. And so um, we got engaged in that campaign and, and it really was an evolution process for me. You know, as I, I came into it concerned about climate change, but then as we kind of dug into it and we, and we were communicating with people reasons to transition away from this coal plant, I became aware of the health impacts of coal plants and how coal pollutants contribute to four of the five leading causes of death and mortality in the U.S., heart disease, cancer, stroke, and lower respiratory disease. And then at that time, I was about to become a, a father for the first time. And I, be, I became deeply concerned about mercury that's in coal pollution because that leads to neurological impairment that causes in developing fetuses and infants. And I, I was so passionate about that, I even created a, a website called Mercury Morality. It's not, uh, I don't think it's up there on, anymore on the web, but, but I was, became very passionate just out of uh, love and concern for uh, my daughter. And, and it was during this time that we would go up to the state capitol and we'd rally. And at one, one of those rallies, I remember there were counter protesters from a union that only worked about, they weren't actually uh, plant employees. Uh, they were contracted and worked about 10% of their time at, at the, the coal plant. They had come up as counter protesters. And um, so we went to a seminar with them after the rally and we talked about the, the climate and we realized they, they were concerned about the environment, uh, but they're also concerned about their jobs. And one of the great things is that there's a faith-based organization in the state of Washington called Earth Ministry, which really became 
advocates along with labor and being concerned about the plight of the workers. And so um, as a result of that, the uh, governor's office, the corporation from Canada that ran the coal plant, the union at the coal plant, environmental organizations like the Sierra Club, and then faith-based organizations like Earth Ministry, they all came together and ironed out a plan to transition away from the coal plant over a number of years. And so we're in a competition with Oregon to be the first coal-free state in the nation. And, uh, and at the end, everybody, all these different diverse parties were patting each other on the back and, and congratulating each other. And part of what made it a, you know, a special and unique moment was something that we call uh, a just transition which means transitioning away from fossil fuels to renewable energies um, in a way that takes the plight of workers into concern. And so we had a kind of a first of its kind agreement that the workforce would be retained during the closure and cleanup of the plant. Workers would be trained in energy efficiency and technologies that would replace coal. The company, not taxpayers, would subsidize the transition, and so it was a unique uh, agreement. Um, and I, and, and what I also believe is that, you know, the, our country is destined to make this transition from uh, fossil fuels to renewables. It's just a matter of how how quickly we do it, and and the and the uh, care and attention that we do it. So it's a just transition. So. That, that was kind of the first part of my story, and then the second part was after we were done with that campaign, there's a, a proposal to have the largest oil terminal in the country in the city where I was a pastor. And so um, it's one of those instances of a lack of uh, transparent democracy. The port commissioners rubber stamped it without people knowing about it. And, um, you know, and it was located, and uh, even though uh, that area of the country is a very white part of the country, is located in the more racially diverse, uh, poorest neighborhood in the city. And um, the terminal also was going to torpedo a $1.5 billion mixed-use waterfront development because the development wasn't, they don't, they don't want to put people in nice condos if there's going to be uh, oil tankers coming by those condos. Um, and so, um, there's also the blast zone from the terminal and the oil tankers coming through, uh, included an elementary school. Um, there's toxic emissions from the oil terminal, and in addition to all the climate change impacts that, that you can think of from such a large uh, thing, uh, that would kind of dwarf the size of Keystone XL in terms of its capacity uh, that they're looking to bring through that, that uh, corridor. And so, uh, it's still an ongoing campaign, but it ended up being a, uh, actually a tremendously exciting campaign for us. Uh, during uh, that time, the, the, the leading environmentalists in our city joined our church's members, Don and Alona Steinke. Uh, Don was a retired high school science teacher, and, and Alona was a retired uh, nurse. So they're kind of like the perfect tag team to talk about the, the science aspects and the health aspects of what was going on. And they, they went at this stuff full, like it was their full-time job. And, um, and so one time we were uh, at an event to oppose a coal terminal down the river. And, and uh, there was a couple of thousand people and Don and Alona at, at the local county fairgrounds. And Don and Alona were the main art organizers in turning people out for that event. Um, and at that event, I counted uh, seven either new members or potential members out, you know, to a church out in the audience. So it was really cool to just to be able to see that environmental activism being so connected to kind of the life and mentality of our church at that time. Um, they also organized the largest uh, city council meeting in the history of our city. I think there's about 800 people and they had to go to the Hilton Hotel to fit everybody in, um, which led to a successful resolution at three o'clock in the morning. Um, and so Don was this past year flown out to San Francisco to receive a national award from the Sierra Club. And uh, so it's incredibly inspiring to be in that situation. But, it, but when I look back on it, there were some challenges. I'll, talk, I'll go into a little bit more depth about uh, challenges uh, in the congregation and addressing those issues. But, but one of my regrets is that I think our church if we had taken a more intentional approach 
to making environmental justice a core part of our church's DNA, it would have made us have a much stronger foundation for what we did. And so, um, so that really forms part of my motivation or why I'm so enthusiastic about Creation Justice Churches is this, uh, the work to make creation, care, and justice central to uh, the life of our churches. So it's not something for just a few people in our congregations, but something that's central to being a Christian. Um, so to, to kind of begin the, the more interactive uh, part of this, I'd like to begin with the question that you can uh, shout out answers to. If I said I belong to a green church, what would come to mind for you? Recycling. Recycling. All right. <laughs> Solar panels. Solar panels. Energy right. efficient. What was that? Energy efficient, like light bulbs, etc. Racial inequities. Right. Native plants. Native plants. Yeah. All right. Local, I think, local foods, tame. local flowers. Local All right. Tame stuff. Tame? Tame. I'm not sure I'm catching that. Tame? Tame. It's not very edgy. You know. uh, oh, oh, okay. I get what you're saying. Okay. I thought there was a new program out there called Tame. I was about to be embarrassed that I didn't know it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. One other thing I'd, I'd like to add um, to make it intergenerational, not just for all the adults in the congregation, but to get the children and youth involved, make it fully integrated in the life of the congregation, I think is really important. Same with older people. There are many older people who feel they no longer really have a place to be active as they once were in the church, mm -hmm. but there's so many things that can be done at home that will help foster some ideas to, for the congregation to be more involved in green efforts. Those are all really good answers. And I, th I think one of the things I kind of wanted to push, and this is central to the Creation Justice Church's program, is to kind of broaden what we think of when we think about what it means to be a green church. That often the, when I ask that question, no, no matter where I am, a lot of the answers focus on kind of the physical maintenance or, of the church. You know, and, and those things are wonderful and good. I'm not going to discredit that. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, there's a lot of other aspects of church life. It was worship theology, child education, you, and so forth. And we'll later kind of talk about almost every aspect of church life. Um, so there's that part of it. But then the other part is that as Christians, we're also called to go beyond the walls of the church. Um, and we'll talk about how love of neighbor and love of God's creation can, can push us beyond those walls. And so to, to assist churches in developing a kind of a deeper and broader understanding of, of what it can be mean to engage in that level, uh, we created this Creation Justice Churches program. And the first thing I want to say about the program is it doesn't have uh, rigid prescriptions. I know in the UCC, we don't like people telling us what to do. Uh, and so we give freedom for congregations to discern uh, what is their path in making creation justice a central part of their DNA. At the same time, uh, we provide resources and ideas that are continually evolving. So we, we even do a Creation Justice Church's Best Practices series. And if your church does something cool and unique, I want to know about it and ask you to, to write about it so we can share it with others as part of that cross-pollination. Um, in fact, we've uh, the community church in Raleigh wrote, wrote about how they raised money for uh, their solar panels because that was unique how they went out to the broader community for that. Um, so I, what I'm going to ask uh, Karen to help me pass out some, some questions to help us dig deeper into to thinking about these issues. Um, so part of, part of how the Creation Justice Church's program works is that right now it's uh, largely web-based. 
And so there's, there's six steps uh, for becoming a creation justice church. And at the core of it is a step where congregations think about four different areas. And then there's two guiding questions to think about those four different areas that, that one can find online. And I've adapted some of uh, the resources uh, uh, from that that are found and, and put it into this handout that you're, you're given just to generate some thinking about what it means to be a, a green church. And I guess I'm, I'm not presuming that churches are you know, doing a good or bad job about this. Our first creation justice church was in no. northern, uh, North Hollywood. And uh, they, they've been a uh, creation justice church for, for years as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, in uh, California, the Interfaith Power and Light gives out a, a green Oscar for their, their top congregations. And so they're, they're a green Oscar winner in, in California. Um, so one of the, uh, the first area that you'll see is we, you know, we focus on theology and worship as really the foundation for becoming a creation justice church. And there's resources for that, but just to think about uh, where your church is at, some questions to consider is how much is creation care a part of what your church does in worship? Is it present every Sunday or just a couple of times a year? Um, when you think about the gifts of creation, such as air, water, food, how present do you think creation care and justice should be when it comes to worship. So, so any any thoughts or reflections on that when you when you think about your own church setting and and the role that creation care should have? Yeah. Well, that was one of the motivations for me to develop the Earth Sabbath celebrations, and I did that through. I have two hats that I wear: church pastor in the UCC and also working with the Council of Churches here in North Carolina and before that in New Mexico, um, where the Council of Churches really was way ahead of the curve in terms of getting congregations involved in eco-justice um, issues. Uh, but I began to realize that it was lacking in our worship life. You know, it, it wasn't pra the prayer life of the church, the hymn life of the church, the sermons, um, you name it, what we do in worship didn't generally make direct connections with our caring for creation. And stewardship was always thought more of a, a money thing, you know, rather than taking care of God's <clears throat> creation. And that worship really needed to, to be infused with something new. And that in order to do that, maybe we had to look outside of our usual realm of, of worship materials. And that's where I started to get involved with Native American things and from other faith traditions, um, as well as uh, the Jewish and Christian traditions. St. Francis is probably the best mm -hmm. worship resource that any congregation could ever have. Just the writings and writings about St. Francis. Just go there and you'll find a wealth of information. I was just gonna say, I transferred into Wake Forest Divinity School and in the chapel, students of all backgrounds, a lot of the hymns still are this dichotomy between the material world and the spiritual, like we're going to the spiritual place, but it's not like caring for the place we are now, that that is spiritual. And so I think a lot of those assumptions underlie the older traditional forms of worship, and that's something to deliberately counter. You know? <laughs> Other thoughts and reflections? I think too that so much of that is dependent on the minister's comfort level with creation care or connection with creation care. Because um, I know some ministers just, it's just not their focus. And so to ask them to start preaching about something that they're not particularly focused on or tuned into be difficult. They're okay to say, oh yes, the creation care team can do a their service once a year kind mm -hmm. of thing, and the youth can do their service. But I think when the minister himself or herself is not really connected to the issue, it's hard to incorporate that into worship. Okay. We, we are uh, looking to include uh, 
creation oriented uh, materials in the, the new marks for the ministry, which is part of what the UCC provides for ministers in formation. But um, so that hopefully it'll be a, a part of becoming a, a clergy member now. Yeah. So it's sort of a challenge and an opportunity. On the challenge side, it seems like the <coughs> secular discussion around these issues is so politically polarized. So there's a green, which means liberal, which means a whole set of associations, and then not green in the public sphere. Right. And it seems like the, the church, I think, has an imperative to try to figure out how to frame these issues in ways that don't um, don't um, reify or reinforce or strengthen the, those polarities. Hmm. The church can, I think, needs to be a voice of a message which can't be easily politically categorized. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I find, like, I, I teach on these things. I've had to take any reference to color out altogether because green, yeah. I will lose 50% okay. of my audience with that one word, that right. one color right. term, it's done. Yeah. And so trying to figure out how to create a different kind of discourse, sure. a different way of thinking, and one that allows people to um, have their own political mm -hmm. uh, orientation and still find a way into this conversation, I think is one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. I think you're also right in, in highlighting as an opportunity. On the one hand, you can think of creation care as kind of the easiest thing to have a, a common denominator on. We all breathe air, we all drink water, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, these are all gifts of creation that we enjoy every day and maybe often take for granted, you know? And so there's as that aspect of it. Uh, the other aspect though is, you know, studies show that when it comes to uh, an issue that may be controversial in some areas uh, like climate change, that it's moral and faith voices that people find the most persuasive in our country. And so we really have a tremendous opportunity uh, in, our, in our churches. Uh, to be persuasive, and it does, you know, may, may require thinking about the language that's used. I know we have a, a pastor in North Dakota, you know, who uh, will tell me similar comments to yours about words that she describes as trigger words, that if she says them, people go off and, yeah. and they're not listening anymore, yeah. you know, and so, but I think because there is such a, you know, common denominator that can be found there, there's, there's always a place to meet people where they're at, so. I think one of the, ch uh, the tensions or challenges, Dan, is the, I think in the constellation of values, when one says one is green, there has to be a certain element of advocacy, mm -hmm. which I think automatically is a, is a trigger for, for many people. Because I know that, you know, I cannot recycle alone. So if somebody, if somebody ahead of me, you know, really develop a, a recycling system, uh, fortunately, uh, if we're going to meet the carbon reduction standards uh, that, that are out there as guidelines, it's not going to be by solar panels on my house alone that that's ever going to happen. And so, so if that's a goal, then there's going to be advocacy to do it, mm -hmm. which is already going to raise flags about, you know, because I, I think that's that's what's difficult, is how, how to bring these things up. Yeah. So they don't aren't immediate triggers, but on right. the other hand, if we're not going to achieve what we need to achieve without advocacy. Yeah. yeah. Have to have some pushing of the envelope. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think one problem, uh, theologically, is what I would call the tyranny of history, that the church, at by and large, followed the notion that God acts in history, and so what's important are historical events, mm -hmm. rather than God's presence in creation. Um, and it used to be, anyway, that Scholars, for example, would say, isn't it wonderful that Israel connected all of its agricultural festivals to the Exodus? Well, it is wonderful, but it disassociates them from creation and nature. There's great fear of paganism uh, involved in nature worship and all that. And I think the church has to catch up with this notion of God's presence in creation as well as in acts of history. Yeah. something to look out for. I just... Uh read a book that's yet to be published uh, called, uh, man, I can't, I'll have to go back and look at the name, but it's written by a, a UCC pastor named Robert Shore Goss, and it, it does an excellent job of going through some of the 
the, the past theologies and some of the uh, great new theologies in, in that area. So it's worth looking at. Can I add to that? Yeah. Um, that that's a great point. Um, and the evangelical church is starting to pick up on, on creation care in their own way. And so they tend to be politically aligned a little differently than the United Church of Christ, of course. Um, but anyways, Catherine Hayhoe, who was a climate scientist married to a um, evangelical Christian minister of a large megachurch, has worked this out in their family. And so she said, what, what she says is that the word of God is in the Bible. Nature is the illustrations. Right? Nature is the illustrations. And it used to be in the church before we got so mm -hmm. engrossed in the printing press and the written word that people worshiped with hearing the word of God through the preaching and expository work, but also the book of nature. And they, they looked at the two as co-equal. And we have reversed that so, so that they're not co-equal any longer. One is in ascendancy and the other is in descendancy, and we have to rebalance it. That's what we're all about, I think, in the world today, is rebalancing that so that it's a proper um, approach to God's creation. Yeah, something our uh, secular environmentalist friends sometimes forget is you know, John Muir is the, the, the founder of like, the Sierra Club and so forth, and the great conservationist, but he was deeply religious in his view right. of nature. Yeah. You know, thinking of nature as God's cathedral, and as uh, as uh, as uh, kind of the the written word of God uh, in, in nature, and so so that's a, that's a good point that you're making. Yeah. That's another layer to that. That's like when you go back maybe a couple hundred years, you know, because the written word was suppressing what people heard in church. But maybe just considers what society delivers. So I just think taking religion out of it, you know, and God out of it for a moment. Just look at what, you know, industrial society delivers to us and how we live. I think that's the chief enemy because it alienates us from the land. And so we can, two people, you know, like you can find some rural farmer in India or Bangladesh or someplace and they can look at a Bible passage and, and then we can look at a Bible passage maybe and, and not see the same um, earth caring c connection. In other words, the empathy just isn't there uh, most of the time because we live in different worlds. I, I think that's what I see. Mm -hmm. We're different. We're not. We're not earth people, mm -hmm. and we're trying to be. Yeah. Trying to recapture that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and then you know. And then you know. It's like saying, "Oh, there's an imperative." You know, there's an imperative. God wants us to do it. And then, you know, so it's kind of like you're trying to refit. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, Diana Butler Bass's most recent book is, is, has a whole section on soil and, and, and how there's parts of Christianity that are kind of reconnecting and being revitalized by the reconnecting uh, with the soil, air, and water. Uh, and she talks about how uh, often uh, farmers have an intuitive connection to the soil uh, and where they are. Yep. What was that book again, please? Uh, the author is Diana Butler Bass. I'm actually uh, grounded. Grounded, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, again, it's also a very incarnational theology of, of approach there. Brooks. Yeah. So I'm thinking about what we can do in worship to bring people's attention to creation yeah. care more. Maybe occasionally doing an altar setting with uh, some things that we don't may not think about commonly to recycle. We know that eyeglasses can be recycled in certain ways. But most people just leave them in their drawers at home and they start accumulating. Nothing good happens with them. It, and the same thing with household batteries, so particularly things like um, hearing aid batteries. And I'm thinking again about how senior adults can be involved too. And to make little boxes and uh, name them appropriately and put them on the altar and say, 
as we clean these things, like plasticware that we use to throw away, use one time to throw away, bring these things and put them in the box as a way of worship to keep these things out of uh, the environment in such ways that it top puts toxins in the soil, etc. Yep. So those kinds of things during worship will accomplish several things. Yep. Yeah, those those are good ideas, and and in the spirit of cross pollination, I think you know it's great to be able to share those ideas. Uh, we've got churches out there that have, have done some uh, interesting things along those lines. Just to mention a couple of things that uh, some of our churches are doing out there. Um, there, I think it's the World Council of Churches has endorsed a new liturgical season called the Season of Creation. And so that's uh, kind of in the October period and over, I think, four Sundays. And so uh, there's resources online to look at how churches do that. Uh, just had a church in Montana go through a season of creation and found it to be a powerful experience as well as Battle Creek uh, Church just did it. And so uh, that's something to, to look into. Um, then, uh, yep. Go ahead. The uh, one of the uh, UCC endorsed curriculum called the, um, Seasons of the of the Spirit. Their focus of the last two years on liturgical resources and resources for education is around the season of creation. Okay, great, great, good to know. Yeah. So, um, so there's de there's there's a number of resources online of of churches and, and places like Earth Ministry that that kind of collect all of these things to make them available uh, to people. And so all of that is part of the Creation Justice Church's website uh, to find links to those ideas. Um, one other idea I'll also mention is being connected to, uh, connecting worship to one's immediate local environment. And uh, so we have a church in Knoxville, Tennessee that has a mountain Sunday and they, they celebrate the beauty of mountains and then they also raise awareness about mountaintop removal. And so being able to think about connecting people to uh, the sacred uh, lands and areas uh, close to one's church and our obligation to those lands and areas uh, can also be a powerful experience. I wanna move us on to thinking about the, the next uh, of the four areas, institutional life and practice. And and something I'll say about this is uh, various Korean church programs have had different approaches to it. And usually what they recommend is to first begin with a green team and move from, move from there. And I think that that's a perfectly fine approach. But something I've also witnessed in churches, including the church where I was a pastor, is, is that isn't always the, the most appropriate church given its con uh, way to go about things, given a church's context. And so uh, one way, to, you know, in some churches, they might feel that people are already spread thin on committees and they have time for another committee. And I think that it can actually be fine and, and work to that church's advantage in moving things forward. Because ultimately, even if one has a green team, you, in a sense, you want the green team to work itself out of a job. Because you want every ministry in the church to take on uh, an environmental consciousness and awareness and infuse it into their ministry. And so uh, so some churches, it could be the effort to become a creation justice church. It could be driven by the governing council or it could be driven by the social justice committee. But I think it's whatever is appropriate uh, in the life of your church. And so in some cases, often it is good to have a green team. Um, and the other thing I'll mention about green teams is uh, in churches, I think that one of the organizational uh, challenges that we face is the hourglass effect. So that you know, whether it's a social justice or environmental justice, you can have a church with all of this energy, people that want it, that do care about the environment, but then it all gets funneled down into just a handful of people who are on the green team. And the problem is then how do you get it to disperse back out into the, the congregation. Um, and so that, that's part of what this section here on institutional life and practice is. Our resource page uh, for this uh, talks about doing uh, a green church inventory where you think through all the teams, committees, boards, and ministries in your church and 
and the, and then you work with people on all of those committees to you know meeting them where they're at and kind of uh, inviting them to be a co-conspirator and, and thinking about how they can bring an environmental perspective to their ministry. So, so I just uh, think through all the teams and committees at your church, and and do you see? Can you see an environmental uh, perspective for creation, care, and justice being interwoven into each and every ministry in your in your church, or do you, or do you see some some challenges there? Oh, there'll be some challenges. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but don't let that stop. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I think that um, <clears throat> in this church, I find that there's an enormous number of good people doing a number, an enormous amount of really good work. And from my kind of view, there's economic justice issues and racial justice issues and creation justice issues. And so the you kind of want to see all of those issues through all of those lenses, right, in order to kind of be integrated. And I think it's hard to do that. Yeah. That big of a big cut. She just made me think about a church that I visited in another state, and they handed out a prayer guide to all their parishioners. And it was a refrigerator magnet because it worked nice. But each day of the week they prayed for another aspect. And the whole church then was praying, and one of them was about the care of the creation and how we connect um, and tell others about the beauty and the wonder and save it type of thing. But they laid out this side of a litany for each day of the week to be praying about different ones, and it, it was part of that idea of integrating the ministries. And then that idea. Well, Brooks, what I see most often is the hourglass effect that you were speaking yeah. of, and uh, the, and at times the tension of having one group in the church make decisions that impact another group of the church right. but that may not have been a part of those. You know, it's one yeah. thing for Earth Ministries to say we ought to do X, Y, and Z, and it's another to expect the fellowship board to yeah. carry it out because yeah. uh, you know it becomes a burden. So it's how. It's how to do how to do this such that it becomes a part of the, the DNA of the whole church. And I've kiddingly uh, said that we ought to start offering classes and how to run the dishwasher, so that everybody knows how to run the dishwasher. Uh, if, if you want to use uh, you know to, you know real plates and have them watched every Sunday, everybody ought to know how to run the dishwasher. Yeah. My name is Gene Miller, and I really have thought for all of us that the United Church of Christ is very much. One thing that, um, because I, I joined the church about five years ago, and I um, actually started the Caring for Creation team, and, and actually, I can't even believe how successful we've been, and people were open to it. But one thing that I have found had to be extremely um, helpful is I have sort of infiltrated key areas of the, of the congregation, and one of those things really has been Showing up at other meetings, I also work as property manager, so I kind of need a, I kind of laid this foundation, so I knew everything that was going on in the church, and then brought counsel in to be our allies, and that has gone really, really well. And if fellowship can't do it, they'll just bring it out right at counsel. Like that is not going to be trustworthy over But then it has brought in all the other groups by just throwing out all the ideas to counsel, and then. Everybody at council is just saying what they could do to help. And really, I think just, I mean, infiltrating is kind of a funny word, but, but that's funny. Oh, no, no, I use that word all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interconnecting. I brainwashed it all my life. It's infusing. But all um, over, yep. you know. So I hear you saying that, that there are at least two important things that the council can be this common discussion area where you can get every, a lot of people from different areas of the church on board. Yeah. And then the other thing that your willingness to attend the meetings of other committees, right? Yeah. Yeah. And be She's present. A pollinator. Yeah, that, that's, that's right. And then, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, I think you probably saw that. That's probably exactly Yeah. I think one on one conversations too with the committee ministers can also be, be good. Yeah. I was going to say, I think another challenge. I think another challenge is when you have a larger church 
And your hourglass is also the 80-20 rule. And in a large church, you'd say, oh, there's a group that works on that. And it can just be relegated. And how to really pull a lot of people in and rotate and get the message really disseminated and connected to everybody. That, I think, is a real challenge. And that's what pollinators have to do. Um, because your, your boards are still only a representation of the congregation. So you have to think that the larger your church gets, how do you get, how do you get conversations around this, this subject? Yeah. for more people to get a better understanding. Yeah, and I would just say the green inventory kind of requires that all the buy-in of everybody to have a conversation. Uh, you know, in each ministry, you know, is going to make a recommendations for how they can participate coming from where as, as kind of stakeholders themselves. Yeah. Um, just wanted to say when, when Community UCC started there, Justice in a Changing Climate program. See, we, they wouldn't call it Green Team. It was Justice in a Changing Climate. Um, and after the congregation voted as, a, as the whole congregation to embark on this from a proposal like, you know, put out a resolution put out to the whole congregation was voted on, then it came back to the church council, um, and the council decided that they would form the, the group that would steer it as it began to develop. And they asked that each of the other ministries, like seven other ministries in the congregation, selected a representative and quarterly they met together as the quote, ungreen team. <laughs> Justice in the changing climate team. But that way it really did begin to connect out with all those other areas of the congregation. So the deacons were involved in the social justice ministry and the mission outreach and property. All those different areas of the church were connected through that. But we didn't want to burden them with too many meetings, so they just did it quarterly for a while as, as we got started. I just want to do a, a time check. Where, when is our, when am I, should, should I be wrapping up here? Um, go, go ahead and talk some more. <laughs> we will work it out. Okay. Well, all right. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to move this along. Maybe some of this I'll move a little quicker on. Uh, but um, yeah, we need to get to the next two anyway. Next two, okay, all right. So uh, I want us to take a look at circles of awareness and advocacy. And the image that uh, we put out for this is that of concentric circles, right? And this goes back to my earlier com comments that you can think of the church as being the dot at the center of the concentric circles and the danger is focusing only on the dot and not going out to the broader circles where it's your community, it's you know your state, your country, and the global world uh, and bringing all those into one's awareness and in realm of advocacy. And so, um, so the questions that I've got put down here are how aware is your congregation of environmental issues in the broader world from local to global? For example, do members know where your church gets its electricity from and whether the generation of that electricity entails negative health impacts for nearby communities? Uh, here it's important to bring in that, the lens of uh, environmental racism, looking at issues of race and class. And then do members have a sense of the current global impacts of climate change, whether it's an island nation in danger of going extinct or the Syrian refugee crisis? And so um, any, any thoughts or responses as to uh, when you reflect on your, your own church with those questions? Yeah? Well, uh, the first word that popped in my mind was um, uh, do, do, you, uh, do you ever use surveys? Is that too intrusive? Because you might think people have a certain level of awareness but you know, you've never had a deep conversation with hundreds of people. Uh, it, could you get off the hook and say, we're going to find out where everyone is and have a survey done properly and then present it to the community? Have you ever done that? Uh, you mean within a, con a single congregation? Yeah, and yeah. then you know, once it's sort of formed, you know, you can just build it out. But I mean, it's nice to see empirically where things are. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say that I, I've done a survey in a congregation I've been a part of, but 
but I think you know it's a it would be interesting to to actually see where people are at rather than just kind of guessing yes, or assuming, right? Yeah. yeah. Good point. Actually, we did when we started our program at Community UCC. We did do some surveying, um, and, and primarily what we were looking for was where people in the congregation wanted to engage in. You know, what were their personal issues like? You know, did they want to learn more about recycling? Did they want to learn more about energy conservation um, or efficiency in their own homes? Did they want to learn about um, the effects of uh, the kind of transportation systems we use in the U.S. and how that impacts their own lives? So we did do some gathering information through some surveying. That's a little less intrusive, where you'd like to be, what you'd yeah. like to learn. Where are you? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it, it also addresses the question that just a flat out survey of, you know, for lack of a better explanation, finding out what people know, what, what people are aware of, so this is, could be a real turn off. Uh, it would be lovely to have that information, but um, we have to be very, very careful about how we get that information. And I, I think the idea of a survey of what do you want to know more about, maybe maybe starting out with a you know sort of a list of, of things that are in our view, and then what do you want to know about? So one thing I just uh, there are some resources that actually uh, that I didn't know existed until I looked into it, but there are now maps that can map out for you uh, different, it'll layer out your community, your state, uh, visually as to, okay, where do people of different races live? Where do people of different incomes live? And then it will map where coal plants are and where all sorts of different uh, facilities that contribute to environmental pollution are. And so if you want to get a map of your community to see where things are located, uh, that's easily done. You just, you can, it's easy as putting in your zip code in a computer program online. So, so that's just a resource I like to, to make available. Yeah. Where, where can we find it? Uh, you, you can find it going through a, a website. If you want, I can email it to you later, but it's on the Creation Justice Church's uh, page. Um, and I, and so I can get that to you later. Good. Uh, and I'll also mention movies can be a good way of uh, excellent movie called The Island President about a uh, island nation in danger of going extinct and they have a, a Gandhi-like figure who, who's a nonviolent leader there. I think he's currently back in prison, but, uh, but that's an inspiring story. A movie called Climate Refugees is another uh, good movie to, to get at those global awareness. Uh, and of course the encyclical by the Pope. Uh, and, and the writings of Desmond Tutu uh, can all help as well, uh, bringing that global uh, inequality perspective to bear. Um, then the, this, the next area is connections to a broader movement. And this is where I think the, the network uh, that's being formed in your conference is so exciting. Um, to see uh, as this a, a great way to be connected. So, but questions here within the UCC, what are ways in which your church can connect with others? And then outside of the UCC, uh, where are ways to connect an interfaith ecumenical and secular partners engaged in creation justice church? And I found that this definitely differs from region to region. On the West Coast, uh, the Sierra Club is very strong there. And so often it's the only game in town if you want to be involved in environmental issues. Um, and so, but other regions of the country, like North Dakota, have, have almost no Sierra Club presence. You know, and so you have to look to different, they're actually uh, faith organizations would be the better, much better route. So, um, but I definitely encourage people to think about secular partners because they often have the, uh, the campaigns and the funding. Uh, that and they're often looking for a, a faith partner uh, to contribute a unique voice to what they're doing. Sometimes they're looking for a space to meet in. Mm -hmm. and churches are a great place for that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. I'm trying to decide. I'll talk about challenges or clues within 
Uh, story about Standing Rock. Would you like? Should I Standing. move to Standing? Oh, okay. okay. All right. I'll 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 turn. All right. Well, uh, I did have the uh, fortunate opportunity to be able to go to Standing Rock as part of an ecumenical contingent. Uh, and to be there on the day that the court decision was announced a couple of Fridays ago. Um, and for those of you unfamiliar with the, the circumstances there, um, the Standing Rock Sioux tribe, which is a reservation overlaps North and South Dakota, uh, a pipeline uh, is uh, under construction that go a half mile from the reservation and threaten their water supplies uh, through the Missouri River. Um, and, and also go through sacred burial grounds uh, that have already been uh, desecrated and they've begun the process of desecrating and destroying. Um, and so um, uh, the pipeline, of course, would have uh, large environmental impacts as well in terms of climate change. So the, uh, what's happened there is uh, improvised camps. Uh, now they say that up to 9,000 people have joined these improvised. There's four improvised camps. Uh, the first one being uh, uh, this is kind of most known as the Sacred Stone Camp. And, um, and so the, the tribe invited uh, this ecumenical contingent to uh, come to the, to the camp that the tribe runs and uh, to participate in the life of the camp and then to be communicators of that experience and what we witnessed and to, to join in advocacy as well with the tribe. And so uh, that's what we did with the leadership of the Council for American Indian Ministries of the, the UCC. Uh, they can actually the lead conveners of the ecumenical group uh, that went, that included uh, Lutherans uh, and Episcopalians and Methodists. Um, so now there's uh, over 280 tribes from around the uh, country and world that have joined. When we were there, they said 10 new tribes a day were coming. Uh, they, and uh, people don't remember a time when there's been that kind of unity uh, among the native nations uh, of our country. And so for me, it was a powerful experience. It was like getting that glimpse of the beloved community while I was there to see this atmosphere of mutual respect, of sharing, of people of all races, classes, uh, and faith traditions coming together. There's also a great spirit of uh, playful humor in the camp. And it's a place uh, that was, that's first and foremost a religious movement. Um, and, uh, and so the main messages of the camp are water is sacred and water is life. Um, uh, the Episcopal presiding bishops wrote a nice piece about uh, how that resonates with Christian uh, uh, sacredness of water and, and baptism and so forth. The, uh, the thing I, that was powerful for me while I was there was if, if you followed this uh, over the past couple of months, you, you'd be aware that the main leadership has come from youth and from women. Um, and so the highlight for me uh, was on the day of that the court decision was announced and there was a big rally in the state capital of Bismarck is I got to ride in vans with the youth who had really initiated um, all these de demonstrations and, and there wouldn't be any public awareness probably if it wasn't for these youth. So back in April, they first did a 500 mile relay run to Omaha, Nebraska to deliver a petition to the Army Corps of Engineers. And then they did a 2000 mile relay race to Washington DC with the petition. And, and in that race, you had uh, famous celebrities began jumping on board. The, the actress that was in the uh, Divergent movies joined them. You know, you got everyone from Bill McKibben to Leonardo DiCaprio joining it. And, and, uh, and even still, it wasn't making the mainstream media. That didn't happen until about two, two weeks ago. But, um, but they, these youth were just incredibly persistent and determined uh, in doing what they did. And so I had this wonderful opportunity to join with them on a day when they were doing a short relay run. Um, and there's a lot of things I could say about it, but, um, but just one closing bit of inspiration for me was after they had finished running to the, the Capitol and we were sitting waiting to go back into the vans, they have all these chants that they like to do. 
and uh, they're, they're like wonderful chants. And, and so they spontaneously broke into a chant while they were additionally just all lounging around on the ground. And uh, one of them just started saying, you know, I, and everybody else said, I. And then they, she goes, I believe. And everybody says, I believe. And, and it works up in its frequent, you know, its uh, rhythm, frequency, and loudness to the point where everybody is jumping up and down, pumping their fists in the air, yelling, I believe that we can win. I believe that we can win. And it was in watching them, and, and after they done all this running, doing that, and having all this uh, belief and energy and, and faith that was just so visceral, uh, that just gave me goosebumps. And, you know, and it's kind of, for me, an aha moment that back when nobody was paying attention to the, this issue, these youth had a, had a sense of belief that they could make a difference. And... And recently, uh, someone pointed out that you know around the world today, native communities are the ones leading the way in fighting fossil fuels. And despite being the communities that have the least amount of power and the least amount of privilege, you know, and so, uh, you know, we I think we have a tremendous opportunity wherever we are. Uh, these youth who were, you know, that nobody knew of in North Dakota, you know, uh, can lead the way, and we can do a lot right right here you can do a lot right here in North Carolina so so just uh, part of it I think is a mental uh, spiritual struggle to make an internal shift to realize uh, and to have that sense of belief that we can make a difference so with that I'll, I'll close